The ACA True Blood Award recognizes exceptional achievement in computation or computational or chemical crystallography. Thomas Terwilliger has made brilliant contributions to the crystallographic community through his software that permits the near automatic determination of molecular structures. His deep understanding of chemical crystallography, statistics, and computer code has enabled him to produce a string of programs that have helped to transform the field of macromolecular structure determination. Tom has been selected for this award partly because of his contributions to crystallographic computing, but also because he fits the Ken True Blood model of generosity and service. It's my pleasure to present this award to Thomas Tewell. Thanks very much for such a nice introduction. Thanks for all of you to, for coming this morning. Ken True Blood was somebody that I knew about, but I didn't actually know him personally. But Ken was a pioneer in the use of computers for uh, crystallographic structure determination. He was involved in the structure determination, for example, of the vitamin B12 uh, that was part of Dorothy Hodgkin's uh, 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 Nobel Prize uh, work at Oxford. He was involved in the work of, with uh, Donald Cram at UCLA that also led to the Nobel Prize. So the computers was a major thing that uh, Ken Trublet uh, contributed. Also, as Cheryl mentioned, Ken Trublet is known for his uh, wonderful teaching ability and his helpfulness to uh, people around him. And so I'm, I'm very honored to receive this award uh, and to be associated in a small way with uh, Ken Trublet's name. So today what I'd like to talk about is, is recent work. It's actually slightly different than what's in the program book, so if you came for what's the title of the program book, sorry about that. <laughs> it's another talk. Uh, I'll talk about something a little different. I'm going to be talking about uh, molecular placement, uh, solving structures using uh, a template from the protein data bank, for example, where you place it in the unit cell uh, with a rotation and translation that maximizes the agreement with the, the data, um, and then you go on from there using that for phasing. So how many people in the audience um, have solved a structure using molecular placement? <laughs> I see there's a couple that didn't raise your hand. It might be too early. <laughs> we need to do a little more exercises. OK, so, so that, that was easy. All right. But now, OK, how many people have not solved a structure by molecular placement? But let me, no, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> How many have not solved a structure? You tried to solve a structure with molecular replacement with a particular template, but you couldn't even get started. It, you did not find a solution at all by molecular replacement, and you gave up with that template. How many people have gotten that situation? Okay, cool. Okay, one more. So how many people tried to solve a structure by molecular replacement, and you found a convincing solution uh, with molecular replacement, but even though you found a convincing solution, that solution was not good enough to go on and solve a structure and you had to do something else. How many people that were in that? Oh, yeah, that happened too. Okay. So, so this talk is for you. Okay, so, so what I'd like to accomplish today is give you a couple ideas for ways that can just move the boundary just a little bit towards solving some of those structures that maybe you didn't quite get before. It's not going to solve all your problems, right? It might help a little bit. Okay. So I, I mentioned the big problems. So the big problem is, one, you can't even figure out where your molecule goes in the unit cell. So your, your square one, you, you lose, you have to start, start with a new template. So we'll address that problem. And then we'll talk about the problem that you found where it goes, but it's not quite close enough to do anything with. So I'll give you a couple of tricks to, to work on that problem, too. So first, I'm going to talk about using um, a technique from uh, molecular modeling, so from another field, bringing in some tools from a completely different field uh, to mix them in with our tools from crystallography and see if we can improve the situation a little bit. Now, uh, this work is a close collaboration uh, with uh, David Baker's lab at the University of Washington. David Baker's group uh, developed Rosetta, of course, and Frank DeMaio, a really, really strong postdoc in his lab and now a staff member there uh, at the uh, University of Washington. Um, did a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about, and Frank is still working with Phoenix um, and uh, the Rosetta groups to merge some of the tools of Phoenix and Rosetta in, in refinement right now. 
So I'm going to talk about two things involving Rosetta. One is going to be using Rosetta without any data to improve a model a little bit that make, might make it suitable then for molecular placement. Um, and then I'll talk about using Rosetta in the context of having a not very good electron density map, but to try to make that model a little bit better. And there's in you know, a circumstance where our current crystallographic tools don't work. So why did we think this was going to be a good idea? And the reason is that the information that's used in structure modeling in Rosetta is almost orthogonal to the information that's used in crystallographic modeling. Let me try to explain that. So in crystallographic model building, the core piece of information is interpretation of patterns of density. So we look at an electron density map, we see a helix, we put the helix there. That's the, that's the core element, or we see a string or whatever. In structure modeling, the core piece of information is different. It's creating physically plausible models. And the people in the structure modeling field, David Baker's group and others, have worked really, really hard over the last 15 or 20 years to develop potentials that are very, very good at reproducing structures that we see um, in nature. So their potentials are way better than the ones we would use normally in crystallography. So it really is a different source of information. Some of the other parts of crystallographic model building are somewhat similar to of structure modeling, including rest of fragment libraries from the protein bank data bank and so forth. So let me just give you a flavor of this. And I want to show you that today, uh, structure modeling tools can improve a model that's not that good in a way that's almost magical. But it's not magical. It's, it's because we have very physically plausible uh, uh, potential functions. OK, so we can start with a, a, a structure that's a, an NMR structure of a small protein. And this isn't a great NMR structure or anything. It was actually automatically done. It wasn't intended to be a super good NMR structure. And as it turns out, it's not that great. And there happened to be crystallographic data for the exact same model um, at high, high resolution. So here's our uh, NMR structure. NMR structure here is in pink. And the, the final refined structure from the crystal data is, is in yellow. And as you see, they aren't exactly the same. But the NMR model overall looks just the same. It's just shifted a little bit with this helix. And we'll come back to that point that things are very locally correct, but globally they're not correct. So in to solve a structure by x-ray, of course, we have to have it globally correct. Everything has to be right place there. But this is too far off. This is more than two angstroms are in this. And this is too distant to solve by molecular physics. So you can't find, with any tools we that exist today, we cannot find the location of this model in the units, in the crystallographic unit itself. Okay. So we take this model, and not using any crystallographic data, and we just apply Rosetta and build a bunch of Rosetta models. So we're going to apply the Rosetta functions to this, and basically we do the packing of this model. And here's just a random one. I just picked up a random number out of a thousand and drew a model for it. And this model, as you see, is a little bit closer than the starting model was. And we can take all the models that Rosetta built, and choose the one that has the very highest score. And that's this one. And that one is very close. And anybody that's done electric placement could look at this and you would know you could solve the structure very easily with, with that model. Okay, so that's one tool. It's basically before doing any crystallographic work, if you have a not too big a structure or you can divide it into pieces that aren't too big, um, of course, that might be able to help you remodel that, that structure a little bit. And so Rosetta's using good potential functions. Um, if you change, and, and that's the main tool here, if you change the sequence from your, if your template is a different sequence than your structure that you're trying to get, Rosetta can use that information in the repacking process. And actually, that's going to be the, one of the critical things that will happen in the next stage. Also, if your structure is missing, perhaps, a fragment, Rosetta can guess some reasonable things of how that might work. And we'll see how varied those are in a second, too. Okay, so let's move on to uh, building uh, models using Rosetta using some crystallographic uh, density. So we're going to do, we're going to place our model in the unit cell, and so we know where it is. We're going to calculate some kind of map that maybe isn't all that great, but that has some information that's not present in the model that is going to let us get a little bit further. And we're going to combine that information with the Rosetta modeling to make a little bit, bit better model before we get going. So let's do that. Um, 
And we're gonna, I'm going to compare this process in the next slide um, with uh, simulated annealing, which is you know, a pretty good way to generate diversity in models. And of course, was that is going to generate diversity as well. So you might see, ask if these are kind of similar. Or not. Okay, so here's a plot um, that where we're, we're generating a bunch of models by each of three methods. We're either uh, going to um, take uh, simulated annealing with a sort of reasonable temp temperature, quote temperature for simulated annealing, this is the, the red one. Um, and or simulated annealing with a very, very high star temperature, so we're going to really shake it, or we're going to run with that. And the, the, the y value here is the uh, correlate is the, uh, the number of models, and the x-axis is the correlation of the map calculated after running one of these processes. Uh, using the model after each of these processes, correlation that map with the final map for this, this structure. And this starting, using the starting model for this particular structure, this is a, uh, a uh, HIV protease structure from Alex Willard's lab. Um, and uh, the starting correlation is 0.29. So that's, if you do nothing, that's what you get. Okay. So we take uh, typical simulated annealing and we generate a bunch of models. Um, there's the red line here, and it's actually centered pretty much on the, on the starting value. Some are a little bit worse, some are a little bit better, nothing's real dramatic. If we take, do some really extreme simulated annealing, um, we get the green curve. It might be a little hard for you to see. There's a bunch of really bad ones, um, and then a few in the middle, and there's a couple that are actually a lot better. If we take Rosetta and do the same process using the density of the map, um, and, and the Rosetta potential functions, they're almost all better. And some are better than any uh, that are done by any other method, and a lot of them are some quite a bit better. So what you're seeing is that Rosetta's potential functions are pretty good, and they move this all over to a slightly better situation. So that's a very nice, nice thing. And this, is the, this is the key. It's not like Rosetta solves the structure or anything like that. It just makes a little bit better models, and in many cases, that's all we need. Okay, so we tried to integrate the Rosetta tools with uh, Phoenix tools in many ways. And so here, we, at this point, um, we uh, use molecular placement in Phoenix with Randy Reeves Phaser. Um, we rebuild with Rosetta, and then we re rebuild with Phoenix Autobuild. And here's an example of doing this. So this structure, uh, uh, which I'll come to later as well, is uh, a structure from uh, Joint Center for Structured Genomics. <coughs> And it has a low uh, identity to the, the template. It has a fairly low identity to the, the target structure. The data used in this experiment is not very high resolution. It's a pretty high B factor. It's very anisotropic data. It's actually a very difficult structure. And uh, so the template here is, is in green. And the structure we're trying to get is, is in blue. And you see they're, they're somewhat similar, um, but there's many things that are very different. So it's, the challenging structure to work with. Okay, so you can find the location of this with molecular placement. So we place this model. <laughs> and then we calculate a uh, 12 mm SFC standard uh, sigma A weighted map. And here, uh, here's that map. And once again, the yellow is what we're trying to get, blue is what we start with. And it's not totally obvious uh, from this map what to do to whether things should move to the left or right. So it, it, that's not terrible, but it's not really good enough to do anything with. And so it was very challenging uh, to work with this. So carrying out this uh, running Rosetta, um, with that density, um, we're starting off with a model correlation of 0.47 here. The Rosetta models are typically a little bit better than that, so it's a slight improvement. And of course, in this case, we know the sequence of the template, we know the sequence of the target, and so Rosetta is able to repack using that sequence information as part of why it's a little bit better. So we do that, and the map is a little bit better, then be a little better. And the pink here is the highest scoring Rosetta model. And what you can see is the pink structure is a little bit um, closer uh, to the yellow structure than the blue one is on average. So it just moved it kind of halfway in the right direction. And that's, that's what we need. So we calculate a new map from that. New map's a little bit better. Um, and we iterate that process, do another Rosetta model. Um, and at this point, we can do standard crystallographic auto building. Um, we can get a fine map um, and can build uh, most of this model. It's a fairly low resolution, so our auto building is not that great. Um, so our fact, three R factor is not terrific, but the map is greatly improved. Um, and this, this is a, a structure that now you could potentially build 
um, much better by hand. Actually, this, as I'll mention later, Axel Grunger actually the one that saw the structure hand using uh, den refinement and, and audible. Okay, I'll give you another quick example. This is of that HIV protease again. Uh, the, the template is 30% identical. Notice once again that the template in, the, in blue, power grid in yellow, they're very similar, kind of offset, but offset in different amounts in different directions in different places in the structure. So the map you get from this is not that good. It's hard to tell what to do. The best, uh, the Rosetta models, on, however, on average are way better. The best scoring was that model is a little closer to the right answer than the starting one. Gives a little bit better map. Can iterate that process again. The next best Rosetta model is a little bit closer again to the right structure. Now we're getting a, a map that looks something like uh, we can interpret it a little bit better. We can auto build that and finally get a complete structure. So that all, the, in these, all these cases were, were kind of on the border, and the Rosetta is helping us get all the way. One last example that shows you what the Rosetta models look like. So this one, uh, high resolution uh, data, just under 30% sequence identity, but Phoenix AutoBuild and AutoMR and AutoBuild unable to solve this structure, doesn't work at all. The MR model, like the, the templates in blue here again, the final models in green. Very similar, uh, but not quite similar enough. So here are the Rosetta models. Uh, so we generated a map for this, and then created Rosetta models based on that map. Now, what you see here is that there's some places where the map and the packing in the structure uniquely defines where the structure is. And so we get a very tight group of models there. The other places where there's uh, where the map is essentially flat and there's very little information from the map about what to do, Rosetta generates lots of different structures in those uh, regions and other places that it's inter intermediate. And once again, the this the blue template, um, pink is the final structure. Okay, so what's our map look like? So here's, the, this is the worst part, one of the worst parts of the map. But from this part of the map, you wouldn't know what to do for sure, right? So the models in blue, right answers in pink, you wouldn't know to move from the blue to the pink, right? But Rosetta can give us some information about that because it knows what the changes were in the sequence, right? And it knows that part of the structure is going to be right and it's going to repack the thing. So here are the Rosetta models. And Rosetta models are, on average, a little bit closer to the right answer. And the highest scoring Rosetta model is one of the best of those models. So actually, the scoring function in this case is very good. We can build a, make a better map from this. And this, this being high resolution, you can auto build it very uh, easily and it's a very nice structure. So this works extremely well. So here's a bunch of uh, cases like this. And, uh, but I want to make a little plug in this in this slide for structural genomics uh, because the coverage of structure space from structural genomics um, on average is much, much higher than for uh, most uh, structure determinations because structure genomics for a long time uh, had a large focus on trying to get novel structures. So the yellow structures here, so all these structures on the right side are the, are the templates that were used to solve these structures. And the yellow ones are the ones that are from structure genomics groups. And although structure genomics has not contributed 50% of all structures in the PDB, it does contribute 50% of the structures that solve these structures. So that's actually a big, very major thing that's contributed. So um, this lit, what this list is, is a list of structures that um, Frank and Ryle got by emailing the CCP4 mailing list and saying, what structures can you not solve? And then you got a bunch of these, um, and most of them were solved uh, by this, these procedures. And then, um, we integrated the features into, into Phoenix AutoBuild and tested all these. And um, this is a list of, of starting from a place model um, solving these structures. What we see is that high resolution often it works extremely well and it's all done. At right, low resolution, the three R's aren't dramatic, but the maps are so much more improved that they're, they're much, much better off than they were uh, to start off with. So we're, we're pleased with this. But keep in mind, it's, it's not solving something that's impossible. It's just going to move it over a little bit. Okay, um, so that was another, another trick. And the trick's going to be related to this first trick, um, in that we're going to take advantage of the fact that template that you start off with is often locally very similar to the structure you're trying to solve, even if globally they're not, if there's distortions. So let's, let's try to use that um, information um, in the process of structure determination to see if we can make it a little bit more powerful. 
So we're going to do a process that I'm calling morphing. And just to make it clear, you know, we use morphing in a lot of different ways. Morphing is changing from one structure of some kind to another structure of another kind. And sometimes we use that in the context if you have two structures and you kind of morph between them to see how it looks. I mean, in this context, we're going to start with one structure um, and an electron density map, and we're going to change that structure to look more like the electron density map. That's going to be the goal. So just to reiterate the point I was making before, so this is that NMR structure and the crystal structure that goes with it. And if you look at, for example, the helix on the left here, it, the, the helix in the template uh, in, 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 in pink is really very, very similar to the helix, the final helix model. It's just shifted by a couple instruments. So we just take the whole thing, the whole group of atoms, and we move them up a couple instruments. It would superimpose almost perfectly. And uh, similarly, over here, that's also true, except that the shift over here is off to the side. It's not up. So it's not a uniform shift. You have to figure out locally what shift you want to make. And that's, that's the whole thing that we're talking about here. And similarly, uh, for the SMRV structure, there, there's many parts of the structure, even rather, rather complicated ones, that they're just shifted. That's all we need to do. And similarly, the, the higher resolution structure we saw just need to shift these helices. Okay, so the idea of, of taking advantage of local similarities is not new or anything. Um, there are many methods that, that use this, and the novelty in this particular case is going to be uh, the ease of, of, of doing this. So, for example, you could imagine just doing rigid body refinement of segments. Of course, then you have to figure out what the right segments are, and so it involves a little bit of it. Or you can use fragment searches, also to accomplish just much the same thing, and actually we're going to use a little bit of that in this, this tool. Uh, den refinement or jelly body refinement are, are both tools that take advantage of the fact um, that local changes might be less than global changes. Uh, what was that modeling I just mentioned? And then the morphing, I want to tell you how we're going to do. Okay, so, so for morphing, uh, our assumption is that the local parts of structures may superimpose very closely. And now, another hypothesis here is that the position of a large group of atoms might be, it might be possible to determine them more precisely than the position of a very small number of atoms if the map is very bad. So you can imagine, if the map's really bad, you couldn't really figure out where a particular side chain is. But if you looked at a whole helix, you might see, oh, there's a few features here, I know where to move the whole thing. That's, that's what we're going to use. And we're sort of assuming that the relationship between a pair of structures amounts to a distortion of the structures. And it's not too big, the distortion. All right, so here's a real example. And so this, the map, the net here is our, is our electron density map. This is um, a primary switch electron density map. And the, the blue here uh, is our starting model. And the green is what we want to get. And I challenge you to figure out <laughs> this map that you should get the green from the blue, right? It's not very easy. But we are going to figure out, in fact, how to shift a group of atoms right here, which direction we want to go and how far. So we're going to do that right now. Um, but first, let's just ask, well, what if we just refine the model? What would happen? So this is uh, what would happen if you do the standard Phoenix refinement on this model. Um, it moves a little bit, uh, not very far. But I should mention that if you do extreme refinement on this model, which in, for Phoenix in this case is 100 cycles of Phoenix refinement, much, much more than you normally do, you actually can get this to move much farther. So just in the back of your mind, you might keep that on. Keep that. There's another trick. Just refine, refine, refine. Sometimes that does the job. But we're going to do it quickly, actually, with, with morphine. So here's, here's what we're going to do for morphine. Um, we're going to try to figure out for each C alpha atom in our structure, we're going to say, what direction and how far should this one move? That's going to be the question. So we're going to draw a circle around um, each C alpha atom. So we'll make a sphere, we'll draw a sphere around it and mark all the atoms. And then we're going to uh, ask this whole sphere of atoms and its density, how should it move in order to match the density of my map the best? And of course, you can adjust the radius there depending on how bad your map might be. And then we're going to do that for each C alpha atom. Then we're going to smooth it so that we don't change things too much. Um, and then we're going to supply the smooth translation to all the atoms in the residue. So our residue is going to 
remain exactly the same confirmation for one residue. It's going to remain exactly the same confirmation and just going to move. The next residue over is going to keep its confirmation is just going to move. The connection might be bad. Um, we're going to fix that with refinement later. All right, so let's do that. So here's that exact same map I showed you a, a second ago. Uh, here's the calculated density from our template. This, so this is the density we'd like to match the blue density as well as possible. Then we ask what shift of that density without rotation, just translation, um, would give the best overlap and it doesn't move it too far. And that's the shift that moves it the best, that makes the best overlap. It's just this little shift, about an angstrom and a half, and it happens to be exactly in the right direction. And we do that for the next residue over, the next residue over, we smooth them all so then we get a little bit more information and we average them all. Um, and so then, and then we apply that, as I said, and then we can refine that model. And so we have our refined morph model. Um, in orange, you can't see it um, all that well. And then we can calculate a new map. Of course, our model is now a little bit better. We can calculate a new map and repeat the process. And now our map is starting to look like the structure. We can iterate that process a few times, and then we can auto build. Everything's done. So we improve the model just enough by this morphing pro process that we can uh, carry out this auto building process uh, effectively. Now, this is a comparison of um, the morphed model um, in yellow but with the, the final auto build model um, in green. And this illustrates what you can and cannot do with morphing. So morphing doesn't change the connectivity, doesn't change the identity of atoms, um, it just changes where the location of the atoms. Yes. So it can't fix things like an insertion of a residue or something. It can't fix that at all. Um, but basically, um, it just shifts it um, over. Let me give you a better picture. So blue is the starting. Uh, morph model is yellow. Final model is in green. So basically, we can look at this residue here. And effectively, the residue is moved over as a whole down, down to uh, this position here. And we see the same thing over in other, other parts of the structure. Just moved the structure over, distorted it based on. So now we're going to ask, um, what's the best map for doing this process? And of course, you have to have an electron density map that's as unbiased as possible, um, but that yet has useful information in it to carry out the morphing kind of process. So what's a good map to do this? And um, once again, we're using this test structures from uh, the Rosetta uh, paper that, that Frank uh, obtained. Um, and these are structures that uh, couldn't be solved by um, auto -well at the time. So this is a plot showing the different structures um, that we're considering. And um, each line here corresponds to one type of map. And the y-axis is basically how good those maps are, the correlation of the, of the maps to the final map. So the blue at the bottom here is just taking the template uh, structures of the original molecular placement solution, essentially, or something placed in the right place, and calculating a map from that and asking how good that is. And so a lot of these aren't very good. One of them, a couple of them are, are recently good. Um, then after just simple refinement of that structure, it's in red, uh, a standard uh, 2FO minus FC sigma A weighted uh, map is the next one. And that's the lower, that's the red line and the group of um, higher ones there. And then we can do a density modified map, omit maps, and primary switch maps. And on average, uh, the best map for this process from these test cases um, is the priming switch map. This basically corresponds to uh, doing density modification um, in, a, in a way that first you use the information from the, the, the model in density modification to get started as the priming part. And then you switch to ignoring that prior phase information and only using uh, the, the features of the map uh, to improve the, the phase, it's named the solvent flattening NCS if there's any NCS. Uh, histograms of density and so forth. So this is a very powerful way uh, to get a relatively unbiased but still often improved uh, electron density map. In this case, it's the best. It takes a little bit longer, so if you want to be really quick, in a lot of cases, the 2FO minus SC map works reasonably well. Uh, we also tested this morphing procedure out by applying it to a series of, of templates just to see um, how well it would work. So we have a, a target structure and then a whole bunch of, of, of homologs of that structure and ask uh, how well uh, the morphing procedure works. And we're comparing it here actually to this extreme refinement that I mentioned, 100 cycles of, of Phoenix refinement. 
So an SS is a, uh, a sorted the structures um, by how similar their starting map correlation is to the final structure. And the y-axis um, is the final map correlation after either um, uh, just taking the template or re extreme refinement or morphing, uh, uh, carrying out morphing process. And so what you see is that um, the morphing in blue is almost always improved over even extreme uh, Phoenix uh, refinement. And it's, a, it's also a fairly quick uh, process to carry out. And all these are almost always better than, than the template. So it works out a, a very, very nice way. One other task we took carried out was to apply this to all the structures that we had worked on with uh, MR Rosetta. And this is a little bit of a cautionary tale on um, carrying out uh, uh, tests on a structure with a varying program over some period of time. So when we, uh, when we carried out the work on the MR Rosetta, that was almost two years ago, um, all the structures that I've been talking about couldn't be solved by Phoenix AutoBuild and AutoMR. However, in the last year or so, we've improved all those programs. So now Phoenix AutoMR and AutoBuild can solve most of the structures um, that were previously unsolved. So anyway, that's a precautionary tale on these things. Uh, so in any event, here are, the, here are a bunch of structures that um, were challenging um, in, uh, for uh, Phoenix auto building. And here is carrying out simple auto building with current versions of, of Phoenix, um, carrying out morphing plus auto building and an MRO set. So the red is just the, the auto building. And so this is the free R value, so low is good here. And so some of these structures that I said can be solved reasonably well by auto building now. A couple of them can't be solved um, at all by auto building uh, still. Um, if we carry out morphing in addition to the auto building, these two challenging ones are now, now solved. And uh, MR is that is the best of all these methods. Um, it solves essentially all these structures. And even though the bad ones that have a relatively high um, free R, actually, once again, except for the very last one here, they actually are still um, the map is much improved over the starting map, so it's, it's still very useful, even though not small, I would say. When also, the time required for these three things goes in that same order. Auto building is quicker. Morphing auto build takes a little bit longer, uh, uh, perhaps. Uh, so the morphing process compared to just refinement, for example, might take uh, 10 times longer. Um, and MR Rosetta is maybe 10 times longer than morphing. So you might use these in that order yourself, right? So you try out building, if it works, great, you're done. Doesn't work, or let's try morphing, it's a pretty quick thing to do, and very easy. If that doesn't work, okay, let's install Rosetta, and when I am Rosetta, maybe it'll take a little bit longer, and it, it'll get a few more structures that you wouldn't have otherwise gotten. So real briefly, let me um, give you one, one more trick. And so let's suppose, and this is going to be applied on top of morphing. So let's suppose we did morphing, and we placed our, we placed our structure, and we morphed it, it's a little bit better. And, but now we want to rebuild this model, and we want to assign a sequence to the model because it's a very important tool in improving uh, the phases, uh, improving the um, decimal modification is to uh, assign a sequence so you know what side chain goes where. Okay, so how do we decide what parts of the model to use, and how do we assign the sequence to the model? And the trick here is going to be, let's use, make use of the connectivity of the template, which is like a totally obvious thing, but we hadn't done it before, and I'll just show you that it helps a lot. OK, so the test case here is going to be a uh, structure from uh, the Joint Center for Structural Genomics again. And as I mentioned, Axel Runger solved this uh, eventually um, using his den refinement in Phoenix Auto. And it, it was very challenging, required him a lot of effort, and so it's, it's a hard structure. And so here's what we were trying to do. We're trying to get this yellow model um, starting from this, uh, this pink one. And so how do we decide what parts of this template to actually use in the model building process? So you took the template, you solved it, you brought it in. Um, of course, you could have cut, it, cut pieces out based on sequence identity. Um, in this case, we're not, I'm not going to do it that way. Um, instead, we're going to morph the model to optimally fit a map. And then we're going to choose the residues just based on density fit. And we're going to create the map with auto build. So we're going to use auto building as a density modification procedure, essentially. So we come in with a starting model, we're going to run auto build, and we're going to get a map at the end, we're going to throw away the model. And that map is going to be our, our density modified map. 
So let's do that. Um, and so this map that I show you here, you can't see it all that well, but the bottom line is that the pink, um, <coughs> after morphing into this map, moves to where the, the blue-green uh, model is here, which is a lot closer to the right answer. And so the morphing, once again, improves the model, although it doesn't change the connectivity. Um, then we can choose what residues to throw away based on the correlation between the morph model and, and the map. And so here's, here's actually a morph model and superimposed on the, on the final model. And actually what you can notice is that most of it is very, very close. And there's only a few places, places that are wrong. So we're going to just trim those off. We're going to trim off all the things that don't match the map. And this cuts off about 80 residues of the structure. And so now what's remaining it's actually really close to the right answer. So we just morphed the model, and we cut off all the things that are bad, and now we have a model that's actually very close to the right answer. The problem is that um, we don't have the alignment of the sequence. We don't know how that sequence, the new sequence, fits this structure very well. Um, and the connectivity kind of is no longer obvious. So we could use the sequence alignment that we did. The sequence is very low homology, though, so the sequence alignment isn't very good. So it isn't actually turns out not to be all that helpful. So, um, so how do we do this? So the old way um, is to look at the map. This is a different map, but just as an example. Um, to look at the map and ask what residues would best fit at each position in the map. And so, for example, position two here, you, know, you can look at that and you can say, oh, um, maybe it's a valine, or maybe it's an isoleucine. I don't think it's a three anemone. Well, it could be, but it, it's not a glycine. Right? So you have like a probability in your head of what's there. Right? So we can make a chart that's exactly the same thing. So this is position and all the amino acids and relative probability at each site. We can put all that together into a probability that says, what's the probability that this is, starts here and goes to there? Right? So you can see that would be fairly easy. Now the thing is, that if you have a long segment, that works great. And if you have a short segment and a bad map, it works not that well. So for example, here if you have 15 uh, residues, the correct answers are not easy to distinguish. There's a couple peaks here that have an LLG. This is the relative probability. It's, it's high, but it's not very well distinguished from the noise. So the short one doesn't work. The longer ones have a very clear location. So great. We can figure out where some of these segments go, the green ones. We could identify their positions very accurately with that, but the rest of them we couldn't be very confident. So we're a little bit stuck. All right, so we could do a little bit more. Um, we could say, um, if I've used a particular sequence already to assign to the molecule, then I can't use it again. That redu reduces the number of possibilities. And also, if one segment is close to another one, then it's more likely that they connect through a loop. You can use that information that helps too. So you can get a little bit more. But the best one is if you start with a homology model or that's actually a homology model and that it's evolutionary related, often the connectivity is exactly the same. So we know which segments are before which other segments. And this is, like I said, it's kind of obvious, but hadn't used it before, it's very powerful. So if we just take one segment in isolation, it could kind of be anywhere in the whole sequence. And we use our probabilities for the matching to figure out which one. But if we know the order of segments, the number of possibilities is vastly reduced. So that means we can have much more confidence in any particular one that matches the sequence, uh, met where the sequence matches well. So now we can do that. Um, and just using that tool, it can get much more assigned. And then you can do a little bit of iteration where basically you figure out the probability where one segment of each place meant for it one segment figure out a combination of those, figure out which ones can hook up. Now you can make longer segments, which are more confidently placed. And iterate that a few times. And in this particular case, we can get all of it assigned. And that's going to happen for all of them, but you can clearly see that it's going to improve your confidence. And just to see how well that works in general and how much the connectivity in, improves the information, when we took that same series of templates that I mentioned before, this actually structure 1A2B has 178 residues. And we took a whole bunch of homologs with sequence identity from 7, so essentially nothing, up to 33%. And for each, uh, each one of these, um, we carried out totally automatically without looking at anything, did, morph, did the auto build model, modeling to get a map, morphing to improve the model, um, and then um, automated sequence identification, uh, uh, sequence matching on it. And then this is the fraction of residues that are correctly assigned to sequence. It's a function of just a template num number where low here is um, the least um, sequence identity. 
And um, what you find is, and the little blue ones that are a little bit hard for you to see uh, are not using connectivity in the scoring, and the black ones are using connectivity. And basically, the black ones are all above the ones with no connectivity. So the connectivity idea helps a lot. And of course, some of these we can assign uh, well, and some not, but they start off with pretty low uh, sequence identity. OK, so to finish up, let me just give you some applications for this morphing idea. So morphing is kind of a general tool, actually. Um, of course, we can use it in the way I just described for molecular placement templates that are close but a little distorted. So we can distort them um, uh, to put them onto the electron density map. But another use of these is actually if you have experimental electron density map and um, some kind of a homology model that goes with that. So maybe you did a SAT experiment and you uh, built part of your model and the part of it you just can't build. It's just not quite clear enough what to do. But there is a structure in the PDB that's somewhat similar and you're able to figure out that it's related to this density and you're able to figure out it kind of goes here. So then what you do is you take that model and the electron density map that you have from your SAD phasing and you morph that model into that density. It makes it more like your electron density map. And now it's a better starting model for your automated or manual model building. So that I use that, it works really nicely. It's also, morphing is really a generalized mapping of one structure or um, as Kevin Cowton has pointed out, uh, one set of density onto another. So you can use this morphing idea um, to say that this structure or this density is somewhat similar to that one, but that it's lo and locally is very similar, globally is somewhat different, and let me distort this one to match it onto the other one. This could be used in density averaging, um, it could be used in comparison structures in many, many uh, different ways. So it's good to think about that. So finally, I want to um, thank a lot of people for, for data. So I mentioned that Frank Miles sent out a, a call for um, for data, a lot of people send him in uh, structures, and here are some of the ones that we that I talked about uh, today. So the XMRVs from Alex Lodauer's lab, the HV 3342 from JSG um, is from Herb Axelrod and Devin Das, and Devin is here at the meeting giving talks after afternoon, I think. And Devin, thanks a lot for this this data, um, and um, many other people who have contributed uh, data along the way. Also, I, also I showed the structure from Raj Popularity um, as well. And I thank all of those people. Uh, for that, there's um, there are scripts in full documentation, and also all the data um, are present for Morph Model and Phoenix MR Rosetta um, are at our Phoenix website www.phoenix-online.org. So there's a section there for for data, and so for each of these papers that came from these, we put all the data that goes in there. So you can reproduce all the things that we um, have done. And that there's scripts there that you can run um, that will get you started. So if you're not sure whether that everything's working, you can run some of these test cases. You can see exactly what happens. Then you can put your data in, and, it's, and you'll know at least that it's functioning properly. On the work that I talked about today, um, I want to thank a, a lot of people. So I. Are named Frank Tamayo and David Baker, who are fabulous collaborators and uh, really wonderful uh, to work with on the combination of Rosetta um, and Phoenix. And as I said, the Phoenix group is still is collaborating very closely. Nat Eccles and Paul Adams are collaborating with Frank and David on refinement and, and uh, Rosetta. Um, Randy contributed to all the things that I, I talked about today. Um, Paul and Pavel also contributed to all these things, in particular uh, Phoenix Refine uh, tools. Axel contributed to the morphing uh, work that I described. Leeway uh, contributed to all the things that I uh, described today. And I also want to thank the um, entire uh, Phoenix project. Paul Adams leads this. He's at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Um, our group um, at Los Alamos, Randy's group at Cambridge, Jane and David Richardson, um, at Duke, and Jane and Dave are here, um, of course. And it's been a fabulous uh, collaboration working with this with this team. It's really fun to work with all these people. Everybody wants to help each other. Everybody wants to have a good product. And I want to also thank many of you in the audience who have, who have sent emails and have sent the Phoenix emails who have contributed to our mailing list and who have given us data and have given us questions, given us problems. Because we like to interact with you. We, we want to have a Phoenix 
uh, tool that does the things that you need it to do. So we'd like to hear from you if there's a problem. We also like to hear you from you when you like something. It's really wonderful to hear that. We get a lot of those, and it, it makes us want to do uh, the work even even more. And thanks for all your time. At one point, you showed the Rosetta models and how, in some places, they were really fabulous and, and all co coalesced together, kind of the core, I guess. And then, on other places, you had quite a lot of diversity and probably more in the loops and, and those areas. Have you considered actually just cutting those out, like you were cutting out bad pieces of the map, and redoing and seeing how much better your map became by just removing the bits that are unprobable or more mobile or what have you. Yeah, that's a really great idea, Tom. So, no, we haven't, I haven't done it. But I think it is a great idea because um, essentially we can use Rosetta as a tool for telling us what we don't know. Right. Because we're basically the same. And uh, I can imagine if you two things we could do with that. One is um, throw it away. And the other one would be to average them a little bit more. And, uh, and we do a little bit of the second one. And that actually does help if we generate a bunch of Rosetta models and we take the highest scoring group and then we average the density modified maps from, we do a separate map from each one, and average those maps. That actually ends up being a little bit better than any individual one. So that one does work. And, um, but identifying the, the bad parts that way, it's a very good idea. Yeah. One more. Okay, I actually have two questions. Um, first, have you considered any kind of MR Rosetta building where you could build off the node template? Like as if, for example, I have um, a homology model, which is only 30% of the overall protein. Not similar overall, but it's like yeah. the N terminal 30% and I need yes. the rest, yes. right? And then the second question is, what would you consider the lower limit of success for morphing or Rosetta? Like what CC map cutoff or LNG for the MR Rosetta match? Yeah, really good questions. So the answer to the first one is, um, no, we're not set up to, to basically build ab initio the remainder of the model. Um, so others actually are working on trying to do ab initio modeling. And it, it does work for um, relatively small domains, basically. So at the moment, it's, it's pretty much hopeless if you have much more than 100 residues in some domain that you're trying to get. Uh, Rosetta is just, it's just computational time is too great. Um, but for less than that, there's, there's some hope there, and um, that's a very promising thing to do. So we are, we're not generating that part of it uh, yet. And what's the lower limit? I wouldn't say there's any particular cutoff. Um, there in terms of sequence identity or uh, map correlation or something like that. I, I don't think there's any number that says below this it's not going to work. Um, it, but it's certainly the lower the, co the lower the agreement, the worse, the more less likely it's going to work. So uh, there's no number for it. Though. Last question. Um, you mentioned that you have a great talk. And, but at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned about this NMR, great NMR structures, which turn to be not so great. Uh, I don't think I said it was great. I said it was, they didn't put a lot of effort into this. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> they did it automatically. Yes, go okay. ahead. Okay. Is that, do you know if this structure is now better in PDB? And my question is more general. We are developing tools which make structure better, or anything else which we are taking from databases, better for particular task. But we do not have, we as a community, we do not have tendency to correct things at the source. And this would solve not only this problem, yes. but many other problems. Yeah, well, well yeah, this is very close to my heart, Claude, because you know, yes, absolutely. So, the answer to the first question, so this structure, the starting model here wasn't a PDB deposition. Uh, so the group that was working on this um, did an NMR structure. They had this automatic, automated structure, and they were trying to use it to solve the structure, the crystal structure. They couldn't do it, so they said it, basically, right? So actually, I don't, uh, oh yeah, it is deposited now. And, oh, actually, I do know the answer. It is deposited, and no, it does not solve the structure. <laughs> no, so you cannot take the deposit structure. You cannot take the number one model from the deposit structure, does not solve the structure, and the ensemble from the undeposit model also does not solve the structure. Yes, so they didn't do what could be done. So, but actually to correct a misapprehension um, about um, NMR models, NMR models are getting a lot better, a lot, lot better. 
And part of the reason is because there's CS Rosetta, which is Rosetta plus NMR modeling that uses the Rosetta functions with the NMR restraints and makes much better models. And um, Guy Montana-Lillian's worked really hard on this and actually has a couple papers where he's shown that recent NMR, NMR models, particularly those using uh, CS Rosetta, very often can be used as molecular replacement search models. So the situation is definitely changing as much better. Let me address the other point you made, because actually it's a really important one, about correcting improving structures um, that are uh, already in the PDB. So my vision is that the PDB will eventually become a little bit of a living repository. It will be a continually updated, continually improved repository of structures, maintaining information about the original things, that whatever the original depositor did. But then the community will be putting in their knowledge about each individual structure or structures as a whole, improving them, um, and eventually depositing in some fashion these improved structures so that 20 years from now, the structures that were existed today will all be improved in the sense that they will have better geometry, have a better modeling process, have more realistic uh, representation of what's there. And so that the people who work with these, these same structures 20 years from now will actually have better information than we do today. And so we're, we're trying to work towards that goal. It's a long ways down there because many hurdles to make that sort of thing happen. Many questions about what's a better structure, all these kind of things. But the general goal, I think, is good. And uh, PDB we do, uh, that uh, has been um, worked on uh, by the Art Warp and uh, Robbie Justin is a big step um, in, in that direction, for example. So I think it's a really important general direction uh, for us all to be going in.